I think the advent of like the internet, you know, smartphones, it's the way it's kind of pervaded into every aspect of our lives. That wherever you turn, it seems like, you know, um, the cars are getting more techy, my phone's getting more techy, like, you know, like there's apps to help you sleep, there are things that, so I think it's, it, we've reached a critical mass, it seems to me, in a way, in the kind of everyday existence. That 20 or 30 years ago, um, it was still something which, um, it wasn't as like operative and kind of shaping our experiences in, in, in this kind of way. I think we are experiencing death differently today um, than even two or three hundred, four hundred years ago. And, and some of that I think is conditioned by uh, advances in science and technology, for instance. Um, and, it's, and it's not just death, it's birth. I mean, think about it. You know, maybe 100, 150 years ago, the places in which one would die or even be born wouldn't be something which would be related to the medical establishment, right? It might be in your home. You might have uh, family members around, you know, um, and particularly even with something like death, even in the kind of late 18th and 19th centuries, the families had a much larger role to play with even the preparation of your loved ones, you know, after they've died. Um, and yet, with the kind of uh, rising of embalming practices in the 19th century, with the undertakers, because people were dying further away from their homes, so they had to some way preserve them so they could actually come back, you know, to the family so that they could actually, you know, have some kind of role um, in that kind of, you know, to, to grieve and to mourn, you know, and to say goodbye. It's, but as, you know, these embalming practices started to take on a more kind of scientific, technological kind of overtones, it then got removed and it could no longer happen in the home. So it started changing, you know, um, where, where that kind of happened. And at, right around the same time, you start getting the kind of real growth, right, of um, um, bioscience and medicine. Um, so that um, more and more you start getting deaths happening in things like hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, to the point that even the medical industry starts turning into a kind of place of just the eradication of disease and death rather than being about the care of the patient. Um, so I think technology and science are really kind of Im have really impacted um, who we give our dead to, and then also who we give our dead to really then shapes and um, how we experience, experience that death today. So whether this is, you know, people uh, wanting to freeze themselves, you know, because they think that perhaps in the future science, medicine, technology is better, they might be able to come back and live longer, or people, you know, participating in space burials, you know, launching their ashes into the outer space, or even the way that we grieve online, you know, and the way social media kind of deals with that kind of mourning process. Um, we, we've really entered a kind of new age of how we relate to, to, to death in a lot of ways. The one other thing we might kind of look at is the way science and technology impacts what we think the good life might be. It seems to me that if you want to get a good sense of what people think the glorious or good life is, you've got to go online, you've got to go to social media. The way in which we attend to the avatars, the way I depict myself to others around, around me, right? So much time is spent in, you know, the kind of maintaining the personal image that we want others to see of ourselves. And I think there's something there about projecting onto who we think we ought to become that we want others to kind of see. And technology, social media, information technology, I think um, becomes the kind of arena in which we start to see um, the kind of constructions of, of who we are and who we want to become. One of, one of the biggest issues, I think, um, which is just so pervasive in contemporary techno-scientific societies is how much technological use truncates our kind of interaction with others. Um, 
whether I'm in a group with three or four other people and somebody, you know, silently picks out their phone to see if somebody else has texted. So the idea of a kind of lack of presence of being with somebody else and really attending to what, what's happening right before us. How is that impacting um, the way in which we can sympathize with others? We can actually attend to who is actually before us, right? Whether this is perhaps, you know, my two and a half year old child, you know, who probably um, I should be giving my attention to. So the way that technologies valorize a kind of um, disintegrated sense of kind of attention that at any moment I could, you know, receive a text from my mother that's 2,000 miles away and it diverts my attention from being present here. Um, so that sense of potential distraction and that distraction leading to a kind of fragmented fragmented social existence and so much of human flourishing depends upon a kind of a deep abiding connection with others. The most interesting thing about transhumanism isn't necessarily those who particularly subscribe to all of the tenets of that particular ideology but I think it's what's most interesting and important is the way that certain beliefs in less extreme forms are pretty, pretty operative and prevalent in contemporary society. So, for instance, the, kind, the transhumanist valorization that um, the most basic thing in reality is information. It's not material, it's not spirit, it's not intellect, or some combination, it is information. Um, and because of this, they think, well, there's really no major difference between me as a human being, the clothes I'm wearing, the mobile phone in my pocket, the table before us. There really is no significant difference except for the zeros and ones that potentially happen to be there. So therefore they say, well, what's the difference then of reverse engineering my brain so that at some point, you know, um, if my body dies, it doesn't matter. We now have all the zeros and ones that made up me for my continued existence. What's interesting is the way that how important information is becoming to how we understand ourselves. So even if you think, oh, that seems absolutely nuts, like if my mortal existence, if I'm going to die, that's the end of me. If you have some kind of program running on a machine, why do I care about that? You know, no, there's no sense of continuity. But that more basic belief in that information is really primary um, to who we are seems to become more and more per pervasive. So, you know, people, you know, getting their personal information stolen, things like this. Um, we, we see ourselves in terms of information. Whether this is, you know, uh, the genome, you know, what's most basic about us, you know, is... Uh, the very biology, you know, that gives rise to the kind of characteristics and personality who I am. Well, all of that's just based upon DNA, which is just information.